I recently got two dogs, and so, not this morning, yesterday morning, Monday morning at 3 o'clock, people start going wild barking at me. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want, I have to get rid of them. And then I went there and shut them, and then, of course, a few minutes later, they start barking like crazy. And I look out there, and I can see something, a big object moving behind the fence, you know, behind my, my super fence. And so I shut them again, and then went back to bed, and of course, they start barking after a little while. And so I put them in the side yard and closed the gate. I go back, back out there, and they're on the top corner of my fence, about big, big, big old raccoon. Mm-hmm. I mean, big. Mm-hmm. big mm-hmm. They're mean. Raccoons. Yeah, raccoon. Big thing. Oh. Okay. And so, I was thinking, wow. So, um, shoot that thing away. Now, then also, I'm, I'm on a different schedule. So, I wake up at 3 o'clock this morning. Mm-hmm. And I'm like thinking, oh gosh, I can't get back to sleep. And then, first thing that comes to my mind is Psalms 91. The very first thing that comes to my mind. I start digging into that, and then, man, things just started coming and all falling together. So this all works. The website I came across, it was occultic meaning of, is what I looked at, okay? When I looked it up, the first word, and tell me, the skies, and then the second thing that it says it represents, now this is really true, true is trickery. Think about it. What holiday has disguise and trickery? Okay, so it got me up early. It represents those two things in the occult. That's what I googled. Occultic meaning of raccoon, okay? That's what I came up with. It's like, oh, wait a minute. It's Halloween. What is when you study Bible numerology? What's that called? Gematria. Gematria. Yeah, Gematria, okay? <clears throat> now, when you get 91, a weird thing happens, okay? This is kind of, if you take the first whole numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way to 13, it adds up to 91. So it kind of points to 13. All right. That was interesting. If you take the product of two prime numbers seven times and you put 13 in there, guess what it goes to? 1991. 91 again. Okay? So now there's 13. So it's a fullness of 13. So it's pointing to 13 a lot, okay? And then one last one, if you square the first numbers, one square plus two square, you know what square means, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Times itself. All the way to six, it adds up to 91. So now it points to six. So here it points to 13, here it points to 13, and here it points to 6. Okay, so there's a fullness of 13 there. <clears throat> now, what does 13 represent in Bible? Gamma, gamatria or Gamatria? Anyone know? It's rebellion. And I find that interesting because in 1 Samuel 15, 23, what is... Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What's the main costume on Halloween? Witches. Witch. So all of a sudden you have rebellion. It points to 13, which is rebellion. And then rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So this is all pointing to like a very strange thing here. I mean, I'm putting this together. like It's like all of a sudden it's 3.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh my gosh. This is the bad side of 91. 1 Samuel 15, 23, and in some other translations, it's like a a rebellion is just a sin of divination. It has to do with magic, 
sorcery, witchcraft, all things that deal with Halloween, which and is kind of strange. Arrogance. arrogance. Okay. So it's all the bad traits, all the bad things that you could think of. <clears throat> so there I am just putting this all together. Wow, it's pointing me to Psalms 91. It's Halloween. And we're going to see why it points to 91. Okay, now let's look at the good side, okay, of it. Well, of 91. So there's a good side and a bad side, which usually when Satan has a bad side, God's going to counter with the good side. It's really God has the good side and Satan tries to make it a bad side. All right, now in Luke 4 and in Matthew 4, when they're on the four or the three temptations, all right, he... He says, throw yourself down, right? When he's, he's talking about from the temple, you know, because why? He quotes actually Psalms 91, right? Verses 11 and 12. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. All right? And of course, Jesus said, you what? Shall not tempt. tempt the Lord yeah. And actually the word for tempt and test are the same word. You know, it's funny. Because when Satan does it, it's what? Tempt. Temptation. When God, does it. when God does it, it's testing. When Satan does it, he wants to break you down. When God does it, it's to build you up. So same exact Greek word, which is kind of strange. But if you guys would have read the next verse, you're, you're going to find out why Satan only quoted verses 11 and 12. Because verse 13 says this, You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Okay? And that word for serpent could be dragon. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert for your adversary, the devil prowls about like a roaring lion. Okay, seeking someone to devour. And again, that's his temptation. All right, so we see a good side and bad side. So I'm going to go through the Psalms a little bit, and you're going to discover something in there that is uh, a little bit different. It says, verse 1, Psalms 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? Where is that place? Where, did, where was God's very Shekinah glory, very presence? In the Holy of Holies. Was in the Holy of Holies inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? And, the, and what was above the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat that led to the Ark of the Covenant? Cherubim. And guess how many times that word... Hebrew word appears in the scriptures. What which one? Cherubim. Seven. Or cherub. Seven thirteen? Ninety-one. Oh. <laughs> you see how this is all kind of fitting together? Okay, so what he's saying here is to dwell, not to make a casual, quick flyby. Okay? He's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, but he's gonna get more specific here. He said, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. My God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. Now, there's probably going to be some deadly pestilence that comes upon the earth here. You know, fairly soon. Well, I know in the Revelation there will be. But uh, maybe before that, right? For the things that they got planned. But here's your covering. It's Psalms 91. Remember I told you about that interview that that reporter from a Christian news network was having some guy in Lebanon who was a Christian? So, well, you got shelter there, don't you? He goes, yes, I do. Psalms 91. <laughs> and he was right. You could prepare all you want. Ultimately, your shelter has to be Psalms 91. So we're going to uncover this a little more, Okay. And let's go to verse 4. He will cover you with his feathers. And under 
his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulk work. Okay? So one's a small shield, one's a big shield. One can deflect at a concentrated point, one would cover you all around. God's got both covered. But here's the point I want to get to. Under his wings, you may seek refuge. For some reason, nobody made this connection. I had taught on this before. I'm going to tell you the Hebrew word for for wings and see who can make the connection. It's kanaf. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. It should. And remember what this is? I just happen to wear this all the time. That is... Yes, seat seat. Mm -hmm. This is the seat seat. It's the tassels that they would put on the corner of their robe. So God said this. He said this in Numbers 15.38. Speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels. Our seat seat is a, our seat seat is actually, is this thing right here? Okay. They put these tassels on the kanaf of their garment. It says, speak to the sons of Israel, tell them that they should make for themselves tassels, or tzitziot, on the corners, or kanaf of their garment throughout their generations, and they should put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. So what they do when they make these little tassels is they do they have this formula. It has to be wrapped a certain way, and it adds up to 613. Why is that? Like they wrap it so many times, and then they have so many cords coming down, they times it by this, add that, and it adds up to 613. So what, why is that? Any, does that number look familiar? <laughs> because the rabbis say there's 613 commandments in the Torah. Okay? So that's why they do it. It's a reminder to keep the commandments. In Malachi 4.2, there's a prophecy that they knew about. And it's going to explain kind of what happens in the Gospels. It says this, But as you who fear my name, the Son, S-U-N, not S-O-N, of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Let me read that again and put in one Hebrew word. Okay? The Son of righteousness will rise with healing in its kanaf. So the Jews expected that when the Messiah would come, that he would have a Jewish robe, and that they just grabbed the corners of where the seat seat oat was, that they would be healed. Now, as you go through the Gospels, you see that people were grabbing the edge of his garment, and they were getting healed. Why were they doing that? Because they knew that prophecy and that's where they looked at it which it, that's what it was so what he's basically saying in verse 4 under his kanaf you may seek refuge you're in the shadow you're dwelling with him in the holy of holies you're in you're literally living with him where shekinah glory is and you're under his kanaf you're so close right on the edge of his garment and I tell everybody, I tell everybody, the only way you're going to prepare for what's coming is by getting close to Jesus. Do what you can, yeah, prep and all that, but I'm telling you, the only way you will prepare is being close to him, period. Put up everything else, put him first. Remember I said, he doesn't want 99% of you, even though if you did that, I think you would be doing better than a lot of people who say they're Christians, right? He wants 100%. And that's what he's been showing me, showing me, and that's what I've been striving for for 42 years. And no, I'm not working for my salvation. His love for me is never in question. The thing, you know what's in question? My love for him. Yeah. That's the thing I worry. I don't care. I don't worry about his love for me. He's already shown it to me. Every time he mentions in the New Testament, he shows us his love. It's never a part from the cross. It's always with the cross. You know? So, remember that. Now, here's the strange verse, verse 5. This is spiritual warfare. Okay? This is going to be interesting. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. So that's day and night. Okay? Covers both. 
of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the destruction that lays waste at noon. Now we read that and say, okay, destruction, pestilence, right? If you look at that word pestilence, devar, and destruction, keteb, okay, the Hebrew words, did you know those were Canaanite deities? They were Canaanite demon gods. So he's not just saying pestilence and destruction as we know it. What he's saying is there's a spiritual warfare. And if you get close to Jesus and you're hanging on to his robe and getting healed and getting strong, then you don't have to be afraid of these demonic presence. Like, is this a perfect night to talk about this Halloween? Yes. This yes. is the night. And, you know, I've heard, I've probably watched over 200 hours on Halloween stuff. But if the, where they believe that the wall or the veil between life and death is the thinnest. This is a high occultic holy day. Mm-hmm. Now, the origination of it was not even Christian. That was, I think it was November 1st. This is off the top of my head. Was All Saints Day. They would celebrate dead people. So that's November 1st. But now, just like you have Christmas, and then the day before is what? Christmas Eve. Eve, right? You had All Saints Day, and the day before was All Saints Eve, our hallowed Saints Eve, our hallow Eve, our Halloween. It got corrupted into that. So now it's the day before All Saints or All Hallowed Day. Okay? So that's where the origin of that is, and it's all occultic. So spiritual warfare, get close to God. And then these two Canaanite deities, which I'm sure are running around, they're just demons. Paul warns against that in 1 Corinthians. He goes through 1 Corinthians 8 and all that. He warns about, you know, an idol's nothing in the world, but I don't want you to get involved with demons because he's talking about the powers behind the idols, okay? And I'll go on and read the rest of it. We'll just have a quick little thing on that. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, for you have made Yehovah. That's the Y-H-V-H. You'll take Vav, hey? Okay. My refuge, even your most high, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. That's your protection in these last days. Um, then here's the verses he, he's quoting. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And they will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. And you will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample down. The actual word Lucifer, that's the Latin word, bright morning star. And you can say, well, I thought Jesus was. He is. But then he he created other things that were reflections of his glory. In other words, Christian, just as I recall, it just means a little Christ. Okay? So you're right. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the good side. Now, what's the other lion? Well, the devil, who goes about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Right? See what I'm saying? Just like the word for um, temptation and testing. Same word, but it depends on who's using it, and that tells you the purpose. Also, 91, I forgot to mention, points to something else. It points to God's faithfulness and his promise keeping. You know why? Who was 91 when they had a baby? Sarai. Yeah, you just reminded me of that. Sarai. She was 91 because God made the promise when she was 90. And said, at this time next year, you're going to have a baby boy. And guess what? She did. She's way past the, the childbearing age. And she had it. So it points to really, believe it or not, that ties into the Abrahamic covenant where God, where God said he's going to make Abraham a great nation. And then, well, guess what? Isaac and Esau. I mean, you go down and it all just ties together. 
Okay? So, now here's a funny thing. I got home, and I knew I was going to teach this. So I opened up my texting app, and, the, and I sent to me scripture last night. The very first thing I read was, verse 14, Because he has loved me, you know, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. I get this. I keep this soft Maranatha music playing in the background all day. For the first time ever, I got home. Right when I read that, you know what it was singing? Because he has loved me, therefore, I, I'm not kidding you, verbatim. I mean, it's just like, okay, God, I, I get the message. I, I will teach this. And I'll, I'll, can I personalize this for a second? If I break down crying, Nate will come up here and take over. Okay, um... But God gave me this verse a long time ago and told me he would apply it to me. And I'm one of those people, people like, the, what is the name of God? Ah, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter, kid. Well, it's used 7,000 times in the Old Testament. doesn't matter. We just know Jesus and he called him Father. Nobody cares. I've gone on a three-decade run to try to find the name of God. Okay? And... I know, it sounds like, what does it matter what God's name is? Only 7,000 times mentioned, right? It couldn't be a big deal. Nah, okay. Yod, hey, vav, hey, okay? What is that? Remember when we put it in the Paleo-Hebrew? I, I took it from every angle. That's a, what's the yod? A hand. Okay, yeah. It's kind of like this in the Paleo Hebrew. And then the behold, or the that is kind of like a, a window, and it represents what? And they actually have a guy like this to represent it, you know. Anyways, and then right here, the vav is like a long stake or nail. Okay, so what he's, what the name of God says in the Paleo Hebrew is, behold the hand. Behold the nail. Behold the nailed hand in his very name. And if you break down Yehovah and you break it down to the three parts, you know what it means? Get this. I am, I was, and I will be. <laughs> Does that make more sense? I don't know. But anyways, God... And I felt like God was telling me because he has known my name. Now, in the very surface level of that, to know someone's name doesn't just mean you discover what his name was. It means you're close to him. You understand all the implications of his name. Names were very meaningful back then. Okay? So, because he has known my name, but I, I don't know. That's just a little thing I had. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation but anyways the very last line with the long life i will satisfy him and let him see my who knows the hebrew is and let him see my yeshua the it's, salvation. yep let him see my yeshua wow that's something okay so psalms 91 it gives you, kind of points to Halloween, all the trickery and rebellion and deceit and all that stuff. But it tells you also how to prepare. So this is a very spiritually heavy night. Which is why I'll probably end a little bit early and we'll um, have some prayer. Because I think it's an important night to pray. Mm -hmm. Now, since I haven't offended anybody, I think I'll offend them now. We Christians tend to take purely satanic pagan holidays and Christianize them. Right. Now, all I'm going to say is, all I'm going to say is this, is that, is, does God give us enough? Okay. And th this is my, I'm going to call this my personal conviction. Okay. When I very, very, very first got saved, he told me he had nothing to do with all that stuff and that he would be enough. And he has been. He has been more than enough. 
then of course, well, the poor kids are going to suffer. Let them worship like the pagans. Okay, well, let them worship like the pagans, you know, because because we're nice. But I'm just wondering. <laughs> I'm just wondering. And then we try to celebrate the feast like Passover, and then Christians look at it and say, "You bring yourself under the law." <laughs> Gosh. And you're celebrating all those pagan holidays. <laughs> I know, I don't get it. Well, we're kind of messed up, but, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, that people worship for the wrong reason or do that kind of stuff for the wrong reason, okay? I'm not saying that at all. We tend to have our own brand of Christianity over here. And, um, again, I'm just going to throw this stuff out. What you guys do with it is up to you guys, okay? Because I don't... Uh, I did, I'll just leave it to you guys. Okay? So whatever you do, do all unto the Lord, but also look what the scriptures actually say. Right? Just follow that. Because, get this, I know one guy, when he first got married, he told his wife, before they had any kids together, he says, our kids are going to be different. He was so happy. And his wife almost started to cry and said, I don't want them to be different. And she won. She won. It's sad. We're so afraid that we're going to be left out. Do you realize that in the Old Testament, the Israelites were to eat differently? They were to dress differently? They were to act differently. They, will, they were to be a different, peculiar type of people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now we can say, well, we Christians have to dress differently. No, we dress modestly and all that. But we are to be different. Separated. Not weird. Separated. Separated, world. yeah. Somebody, you know, you remember that old joke? If Christianity was a crime, which is coming to our town soon, okay? Do they have enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. Oh, yeah, I got my, uh, you know, I got, remember that little lamb picture I had? I got, well, I got that hanging on my wall. They can see it when they come in. No, 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 no. Do they see it in your life? Do you have to clean up the house and hide stuff? So I'm just, I'm just sharing this with you. You know, Psalms 91 is the answer to 911. Just take a one off. Okay. And there you go. It's not 911, it's Psalms 91. That is the answer to how you're going to get close to Jesus and these pagan deities can't get to you and he's going to honor you and he's going to let you see his Yeshua. And I think we are going to see Yeshua soon. Very soon. So that's going to be fulfilled in a very <laughs> different way now that we're getting very close. If I could do nothing but convey to you Psalms 91, Read that, learn it, live it, find out what it means, and it will change your life. But it's a very special psalms to me, very special, okay? Now, I think that uh, we are basically, believe it or not, done. Then we will pick up the uh, study of Jude next time. We're on verse 11.